In this video, we are going to be continuing our journey into the test of continuity of protective conductors, including main and supplementary bonding. In the previous two videos, we looked at an introduction to continuity testing and preparation for assessment. So if you've landed here first and perhaps need to refresh your knowledge, then be sure to check out my other two videos. I've left the links in the description below. In this video, we'll be looking in more detail some of the challenges faced by electricians when carrying out continuity testing and looking in more detail at the regulations that underpin this critical test. And if you didn't know, this video is one of the series that we've made in association with Test Instrument solutions on continuity of protective conductors. You can watch them individually or as a training package to help you with your CPD and receive a certificate as well to prove you've completed the course. In the previous video we've been using test rigs from a beginner to a more advanced layout but test rigs don't really reflect the real life scenario often faced by learners, apprentices and electricians. It's also important that we distinguish between the two types of tests that electricians carry out. Electrical installation certificates, which is for new builds and ensures the property is safe to go into service, or the electrical installation condition report or EICR, which is to make sure the electrical installation is safe to remain in service. So why do we need to carry out continuity tests? Well, regulation 411.3.1.1 in BS 7671 says that exposed conductive parts shall be connected to a protective conductor as specified in regulation 411.4 and 411.6. And it also goes on to say that a circuit protective conductor shall be run and terminated to each point of wiring and at each accessory except a lamp holder having no exposed conductive parts. So this ceiling rose has a CPC, but the lamp holder does not, and that's okay, as the lamp holder is plastic, so non-conductive, and therefore not an exposed conductive part. So I'm carrying out test method one on this lighting circuit. I've linked out the buzz bar as the electrician has taught the connection, so I won't be interfering with his terminations. I also go to each switch to test that the protective conductor is at that point. It is also to ensure that where metal accessories are used, the exposed conductive part is earthed via the CPC. Even on plastic switches, we have to consider the protection as the three and a half millimeter screws are sometimes connected to a metal back box, which is an exposed conductive part and can be easily accessed. But what if I carry out an EICR and I come across a nice set of fittings like this? Well, as this is an EICR, I could agree with the customer that this is a limitation, but how can I be sure that it's not been installed by someone who isn't an electrician? Truth is, I can't and I need to ensure the installation is safe not test the most convenient accessories. So the fitting needs to be tested. A great way to test a chandelier like this without actually having to remove it is by using adapters like this one from TIS. Simply screwing in the adapter into the fitting and placing my probes onto an exposed part of the luminaire will tell me if I have a protective conductor connected to this metal fitting. I am able to carry out the test this way because the fitting is a class one piece of equipment, meaning the metal bodywork should be connected to the earthing arrangements. But what if I had this type of fitting that doesn't require an earth connection? Well, this is a class two piece of equipment or double insulated. This means it doesn't need a protective conductor as these parts are non-conductive or insulated from electric shock. So I need to work back from this point to find where the circuit protective conductors have been terminated. It is important to make sure that we have a protective conductor at every single point as the customer may one day want to replace this fitting for a fitting that has an exposed conductive part. And as long as the circuit protective conductor is here, we allow the provision of ensuring that any exposed conductive part is protected and also fulfilling our regulatory requirements. If you remember from the first video, the customer reported receiving a mild electric shock from the cooker. This would suggest that the resistance of the protective conductor is high and allowing a small current to build up on the exposed framework. I can use my plug-in adapter to test at the cooker point and we can see that we get a satisfactory reading. Now, the customer has advised me that the cooker was fitted by the same people that fitted the kitchen. But even so, we need to be testing to the furthest point, which in this case is the cooker itself. So I'm gonna to test to the cooker itself, and I'm glad I did, because as we can see, we get a very high resistance. And after a little bit more investigation, we can see that the CPC has not been connected well enough. CPC reconnected, we get a much more satisfactory result. 
Immersion heaters are another good example of a circuit that should be tested to the very furthest point. Who knows what kind of horrors could be lurking inside. So do we need to test supplementary bonding? It is often found in bathrooms, but could be located in other special locations. And it is to reduce the risk of electric shock between two separate metal parts, like pipework or radiators. The need for supplementary bonding has reduced as regulation 701.415.2 ident 5 says that supplementary bonding can be omitted if an RCD rated at 30 milliamps or below is present on the bathroom circuit. But what happens when we don't have an RCD protecting the circuits? Well, if supplementary bonding has been installed, we need to test it to ensure the resistance between metalwork is suitably low enough. Supplementary bonding is usually connected into an electrical accessories, like a shower pull cord or switch, and will run in 2.5 or 4 mm squared single insulated cable to each extraneous metal part. It will also link together any electrical items that is in the bathroom. I am using test method 2 to test between each metal part. Problem is, I have a radiator where all the pipework has been painted. So I'm gonna to have to find a discrete spot to remove some of the paint to make sure I get a good connection. We are not given any maximum permitted values in ohms that supplementary bonding needs to meet, but we do need to ensure that the level of potential that could rise in exposed and extraneous conductive parts is less than or equal to 50 volts. Regulation 415.2.2 gives us this formula for calculating the maximum resistance for supplementary bonding, where the resistance must be less than or equal to 50 volts, divided by IA, which is the minimum current required to disconnect the protective device in five seconds. So in my bathroom, which has a shower circuit, it is supplied from a 40 amp MCB. I can look in appendix three of BS7671, which tells me that a 40 amp B type MCB will trip within five seconds at 200 amps. So throwing this into our formula, we get a resistance of 0.25 ohms. So I need to ensure that my supplementary bonding is equal to or lower than that reading. So we've all come to that switch, which has either been painted up to or corked in and a real reluctance to remove it. What's even worse is if it's a control switch like this one here. Normally when carrying out R1 plus R2, I would link out the switch, but quite honestly, I really don't want to remove this one. There is a solution though. We can carry out an RN plus R2 test. Figure 2.14 in Guidance Note 3 shows us how we can place a temporary link between neutral and CPC, and we get a list of examples of products that may require a test between neutral and CPC. So you may now be thinking, why don't we just test neutral and CPC when we test the contactor, as it's given as an example here. Well, let's go and have a look at a three-phase motor in an industrial location. Well, in most cases, it is reasonable to disconnect the DOL or starter for the three-phase motor and test each line in turn. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that an RM plus R2 test is okay, but if we can remove the switch or electronic device to link it out, that is always the best solution. But what happens when you're testing a circuit that's running conduit and you get a ridiculously low reading, even though the run is quite a distance from the consumer unit? Well, the issue here comes back to the issue we explored in the second video on parallel paths. Only this time, the path is the metal conduit. So for us to get an accurate reading of the circuit, we need to disconnect the CPC from the earth bar or MET and link directly to the line conductor. What this has done is stop the conduit from offering a parallel path for the test voltage and current to flow through. So the readings are for the circuit only. So for this three phase motor, I can test between each phase in turn, having linked out at the DOL starter, confident in the knowledge that the conduit or trunking or the tray are not offering an alternative path. So there we have it. I hope this video has helped you navigate the often overlooked yet critical test that is continuity of protective conductors, including main and supplementary bonding. Don't forget that this video is made in association with Test Instrument Solution and is one in a series that we have made on the continuity of protective conductors. You can complete them as part of a free online training package to help you with your CPD and you'll get a certificate as well to prove you've completed the course. And be sure to check out my other videos where I've used the MFT Pro from Test Instrument Solutions. But until next time, it's bye-bye for now.